Hello, welcome back to the roundtable and to our panel discussion this morning for this Monday, the 22nd of May. Very nice to have you with us. Hopefully you all had a good weekend. I don't know. It was a little rainy. It was a little sunny. It was a little warm. It was a little chilly. It was, it was good. It was a, it was a, a, a little soupçon of weather. <laughs> and that's good. Um, we hope uh, that you enjoyed whatever uh, whatever activity you were able to get in this weekend. Let me introduce our group to you. We'll, uh, we'll get started. And uh, love to hear from you. Panel at WAMC.org. Panel at WAMC.org. And we go to, uh, well, John Faso is here. John, of course, is the former New York 19th congressman, New York, uh, former New York assemblyman, um, an attorney. The law, and what else? Father. Yeah, father. Grandfather. Most important, wait, grandfather. Grandfather. Yes. grandfather. Okay, that. Got two of those uh, <laughs> little girls. The newest one uh, just recently, and uh, that's exciting. Well, congratulations. Thank you. It's always, uh, always good to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Jennifer Burns joins us. Uh, did you spend the uh, spend the weekend on a field somewhere? I did. Yes, I did. It was wonderful. I was explaining to everyone before this. My son went through the roller coaster of being Mr. Choke to Mr. Clutch, and so we're working on that. It was lovely. <laughs> uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, lovely, lovely mm -hmm. stuff. David Sewers. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I apologize. Jennifer Burns is oh. U Albany lecturer in Africana Studies. I didn't give the proper title there. Uh, we also welcome Albany <laughs> County District Attorney David Soares. Good morning, David. How good, are you? Good morning. Going from uh, choke to clutch is like my, that's a description of my husbandry oh, over the weekend. Okay. I will take on projects mm -hmm. where I go from choke to clutch and then sometimes. Do you peter in, out? Uh, yeah, then my sometimes it goes in that uh, Again, direction as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's very quick turnover. <laughs> Uh, well, we welcome all of you uh, to the program, and I thank you very much for being here. As always, a reminder that you can join us, panel at wamc.org, panel at wamc.org. Okay, let's go to uh, the uh, debt ceiling talks. They were, uh, they, they were off, and then they were on, and then they were off. Now they're back on. <laughs> <laughs> President Biden and uh, and uh, House Speaker uh, Kevin McCarthy have agreed to restart the bipartisan uh, talks. And uh, as the clock ticks toward a June first deadline, lawmakers express fresh optimism about their odds of securing a deal to avoid an unprecedented default. A day after partisan acrimony disrupted talks around the debt ceiling, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy agreed on Sunday to restart negotiations. So the the hopeful sign we're talking about is is, is really nothing concrete or as, as far as, uh, you know, any any progress that's being made. It's just the fact that they're actually going to sit down and talk about it. And a hopeful sign that the two parties might avoid an economic catastrophe as few as 11 days away. The two speakers spoke by phone and agreed to dispatch their chief emissaries for <clears throat> further staff talks on Sunday night, last night, before Biden and McCarthy connect again in Washington today. Going into those discussions, McCarthy and fellow GOP negotiator Garrett Graves, a, rep a uh, Republican from Louisiana, underscored that the crux of the talks concerns the extent and duration of new restrictions on federal spending. Once that fundamental piece is in place, Representative Graves said, everything else cascades. Is that an oversimplification, do you think, John? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think the encouraging thing from my vantage point, and of course, no one outside of the principals uh, in the discussion really truly understand uh, what's happening uh, behind the closed door. But the good thing, as I see it, is that uh, both sides, President Biden and, and Speaker McCarthy, uh, have adults in the room representing them. Garrett Graves is a very serious uh, lawmaker. He's also joined by Patrick McHenry, who happens to be chairman of the Financial Services Committee. Both very serious, sober kind of people. 
the president has uh, Shalanda Young, who is an experienced Hill staffer, who is now the last uh, year and a half the OMB director, as well as Steve Ricchetti, who is a longtime Biden aide. So the principals have real p- uh, serious people in the room, and that's good. And I think that, um, uh, look, it's kind of where we were last week at this time uh, on this program. Um The Democrats and the administration never figured that Speaker McCarthy could pass a debt ceiling bill in the House with a narrow majority, with a the Freedom Caucus and 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 folks that are really uh, not conducive to a deal or a bargain or a compromise. Uh, But he did succeed in passing it. And that changed the whole dynamic of this discussion, because the president was laying out for many weeks. In fact, as the speaker said, he did. He didn't meet with McCarthy for something like 101 days or something like that since early February. And uh, because the Democrats played their hand figuring McCarthy couldn't pass a debt ceiling bill, he did pass it. He he has a bill to extend the debt ceiling. He has a bill. Uh, th- their bill will um, re- restrain future federal spending going back to those uh, awful days of fiscal year 2022, which was last year, and and the and the restrictions flow from what was spent last year. So it really the the president and the Democrats played a hand that we should have a clean debt ceiling. I mean that really um, is not uh, uh, typical of these kind of discussions. There have been many examples with debt ceiling uh, agreements in the past where you had compromise over spending. And uh, in fact, when Speaker Pelosi was in the room with President Trump in 19, 2019, she got what she wanted, which was increased spending. The Republicans now having uh, a portion of control of the government, half of the ha- House, uh, half of the Congress, uh, are insisting that we restrict future increases in spending. So that's where it is. We have principals in the room, serious people in the room, and I'm, I still remain hopeful that uh, uh, this will get resolved. David, or David, try to get David Source. How are I well. I hope that you are absolutely one hundred percent correct. The message that we are sending to not only our country but also the world is that we are a fragile um, nation when we can't when we can't um, get it together to do something as serious as uh, as as um, uh, raising our debt ceiling. The, the current configuration of our government um, and the, 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 the inability of people to come together and compromise, um, it, to me, is, is placing the greatest challenge on whether or not we see any success. The, the idea that we're only a, a week or so out and we haven't gotten in a room to hammer out these very important details. Uh, suggests to me that um, if anything is going to happen, it is going to be in the 11th hour, but there will be damage. Um, And the idea that um, what also doesn't sit well with me, and I don't know how it's going to sit with a lot of the Democrats, is how is it that we can, um, uh, you know, punish what I would consider to be the poor in, in limiting spending on programs for the poor in order to accommodate um, a party that uh, you know that that won't compromise on the tax cuts that were passed uh, several years ago by then former president uh, Donald Trump. Sure. Yeah, you know, I think um, I agree with David on the fact that this is going to hurt the poor um, and it's going to create a larger group of poor people in America. Um, and I keep going back to the stuff, you know, focused on medical deserts in this country because the cost of taking care and care of oneself and then needing, if you're a parent, also needing care for your children um, with the cuts that are being proposed in this budget plan or package by the Republicans about work requirements, especially in places where there are no work, right? Work is very limited in certain places. Um, those things are going to, I think, increase poverty. Um, and especially if you have children and if you're in a state where there's increasing abortion restrictions, and we've seen in those states when it comes to women's health, you also have disappearing medical practices there to help them um, with maternity 
um, and with just general um, women's reproductive health issues. I, I, I don't see that part of the plan. Um, I see that as being pretty devastating. And just this past weekend, um, a, a report came out from Tulane University, a paper, showing that there's a $450 billion economic disparity when it comes to racial differences in cost for medical help in this country that has been created but will continue to be perpetuated. I think this plan is going to need, by the Republicans, is going to need some altering. And I guess my big question is, is can McCarthy keep his Freedom Caucus in when the negotiations are being made and some concessions and compromises are going to have to happen? Well, the whole the whole issue is that it, there has to be a compromise between the two sides. Mm-hmm. President Biden refused to negotiate, and because he figured, and and maybe there was some validity to his his figuring that McCarthy couldn't pull the disparate group of people mm-hmm. together to pass something. Well, he did. Uh, Chuck Schumer hasn't passed anything because he can't pass it in the Senate. You need sixty mm-hmm. votes to pass it in the Senate. One of the things Republicans are going to insist on, and something that President Biden has voted for in the past, is to make sure we have reasonable work rules. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about able-bodied adults without dependents at home, people who are capable of being in a in a training program or working. We now have a situation in the country, and and frankly, employers all over the country can't find help. And in, in fact. Uh, whether it's I've heard of it, DA offices can't find people to staff DA's offices. We have over 10 million published job vacancies in the country, mm-hmm. which is double the number of unemployed people. Now, take SNAP, which is mm-hmm. also Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also used to be known as food stamps. New York is one of 13 mm-hmm. states that has manipulated the unemployment data so that the entire state of New York is exempt from work rules under SNAP. 13 states have done that. All, by the way, Democratic-led states. They've, they've, How are we defining manipulated? They have basically, uh, you, they, they use the unemployment data in a way that uh, doesn't exempt uh, just areas that you might, which might have high unemployment, say over 6 or 7 percent. And there are actually very few counties in New York State that are at those levels. And they use it to seek a waiver, which New York State has done, and they've not sought to repeal it, um, a waiver so that the entire state is exempted from work requirements. Thirteen states have done this. The Agriculture Department has uh, accepted these waivers, and I think it's extremely dubious. So many people, many average people say, hey, look, I go to work every single day. Why should someone who is not working, who is receiving public assistance, who is able-bodied, who's under 60 years old, who has no dependents to take care of, why should they not be forced to at work 20 hours a week or be in, a, in an employment and training program? So do you think that that's going to be the issue, the largest issue that the re- Republican-led um, House is going to demand? Do you think that that, that, that is that the, that's the compromise? The one the one thing that I think the areas of compromise are, as Garrett Graves said, what Joe Joe quoted, um, is going to be the length of the, they put out a thing saying uh, are their bill said uh, we want to restrict limit the spending increases in discretionary spending for ten years. Well, that probably is not going to be ten years as a compromise. Mm-hmm. It'll probably be five years or three years. Um, they said we'll extend the debt t- uh, ceiling until uh, sometime, I think it was uh, April of next year, April of 24. Well, that clearly, both the president is going to want that to go beyond the presidential election. That's an area of compromise. Mm-hmm. But I think also um, the, the issue of work requirements and the question where the Democrats, I think, are probably going to make be very hard for them to accept is a work requirement for eligibility to for Medicaid. But- you know, just like President Clinton did with TANF, which is the welfare program, mm-hmm. um, we we had work re- we have re- existing work requirements uh, for SNAP, which 13 states, including New York, have completely had themselves waived and exempted from. Look, every employer that I talk to in this area uh, says they they have jobs they can't fill them because they can't find people. Now, I think that's really the crux of it, and. 
in terms of getting people in the workforce, lifting people out of poverty, giving um, you know hope and opportunity to people, work is the best social <laughs> welfare program we can have. Get people in the workforce if they're able to work and they don't have dependents at home. I think so this is the, one of those things where 70 percent of the people, including Democrats, generally agree with this. So my we have less than a minute, but go ahead. When you start, uh, we can certainly finish up uh, on the other side. Just detail, you know, certain details where the areas of compromise exist. My, m what I'm concerned about is the inability of 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 the speaker to actually get the um, the the fringe, you know, wing of his party on board, and whether or not we would have the um, the, the the minority leader, uh, Hakeem Jeffries. Will he be able to bring and deliver those votes? Yeah, if if Biden agree, if the president agrees to a, a deal with McCarthy, it's going to be a bipartisan plan. It'll be a bipartisan vote. All right. We have to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation. John Faso, Jennifer Burns, David Soares. We welcome you, panel at WAMC.org, panel at WAMC.org. We'll be back after this news from the BBC. Good morning. Welcome back to the roundtable on this Monday, the 22nd of May, 34 minutes past 9 o'clock. We welcome you, panel at WAMC.org. David, I had to cut you off for the break. Anything else you wanted to say? No, I was just... Uh it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, how many Democrats are are, are going to be needed uh, who are in the minority right now in order to get this thing passed. And um, especially now when the word compromise does not seem to exist in, in our government. I, you know, there's another thing I've been thinking about, and I don't know enough about this. So both of or everybody here may know more or the listeners. Um, over the weekend, I heard some talk in multiple different radio, um, TV shows about how what the Republicans are proposing would gut parts of the um, Inflation Reduction Act when it came to climate change and fossil fuels. And I was wondering exactly, I was trying to research to find out what they were advocating for that would reduce, you know, either the employment or reduce the um, effect that Biden had initially wanted in the Inflation Reduction Act as it came to climate change and fossil fuels. Do either of you or anybody know more about that? Well, the 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 Republicans and, and some Democrats, like Joe Manchin, mm -hmm. want to expedite um, permitting for uh, energy proje uh, uh -huh. projects that include fossil fuel projects. Um, that's something that Joe Manchin was promised when they passed the Inflation Reduction Act, but was never delivered upon, and he's he's causing all sorts of problems for the administration because of that uh, on on unrelated issues. Um, but there's also there's an aspect of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, which uh, which I still think was misnamed, but uh, the the Inflation Reduction Act uh, as they passed it, where uh, certain uh, energy credits, tax credits, were were projected by the CBO to cost. A certain hundreds of millions of dollars are actually costing three and four times that amount. So there's a there's a desire to rein in some of those things, and so I think I th I think it's unlikely as as a final compromise that mm -hmm. you're going to see. Uh, I don't think the Democrats will agree to some of those changes on on curtailing some of mm -hmm. the energy tax credits that were for renewables. I do think that there will be uh, an area of compromise will be the um, permitting reform for certain energy projects that that Republicans and some Democrats want. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another area of compromise as I, as I foresee it. Uh, but um, it's very clear that, you know, David, you're absolutely right talking about compromise and the polarized political environment we have. You know, there are, there are a lot of people in my party and there are a lot of people in the Democratic Party who th view compromise as a dirty word. They want all or nothing. And I've always believed, as Ronald Reagan used to say, that if, if I can get half a loaf now— and come back and try to fight for it later. Better to get something rather than getting nothing. And a lot of things that are important for the American people aren't getting done because of this intransigence refusal to, to compromise. Now, we have a government structure right now where the House is controlled by Republicans, the Senate, Democrats, mm -hmm. but you still need 60 mm -hmm. votes in the Senate to pass anything. 
presidency is obviously in, in the Democrats' hands. So that, that very nature means you must compromise in order to mm-hmm. get things done. And, you know, the one last thing I, I would say, there are many things that go on in Congress where there, there is routine compromise between and among the different factions and parties. Uh, a lot of things pass with well over 300 votes in the House, for instance, but you don't hear about those mm-hmm. things because they're not controversial. And so that's another feature of the way in which many of us tend to, you know, uh, listen to siloed media where, where you're only getting one point of view. Uh, there are a lot of things, you know, compromise doesn't necessarily generate clicks on media or, or advertising. Uh, and so there actually is more compromise that goes on, but you just don't hear about mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. We have, did you want to respond? I, I and it's also a shame because we wait for these opportunities, like lifting the, the, the ceiling here, to then legislate, right? We shouldn't be waiting for these these moments to get things done. We should be getting things done all throughout. We shouldn't wait for a, a, an apocalyptic event uh, to then begin leveraging all of the things that you should have been working on and compromising on and legislating throughout. Well, a perfect time. example of what you just said, David, is the, the failure of Congress to pass appropriation bills on a timely basis. And that means at the end of year, as they were at the end of 2022, they pass a 4,000-page omnibus appropriations bill, which obviously virtually, you know, very few people have been able to actually fully examine. But yeah. that's what happens when they don't pass the 12 individual appropriation bills uh, that should go through the normal routine in Congress. We have a lot of letters on this, so let's get to those. Please remind, uh, this from J.D., please remind Mr. Faso who created 25 percent of the current debt and that the Republican debt ceiling bill is totally unacceptable to the majority of the country's population. But that yacht owners and private jet owners will certainly approve of it. We go to uh, uh, Robert. Deja Vu is the tune played over and over with this issue every year. This continuing game of political chicken is going to kill thousands of innocent citizens someday. We must vote our way out of this mess. That from Robert. We go to... Laura, who says, raising the debt ceiling being necessary to paying our country's debts. Could someone please explain to me why the president can't just invoke the 14th Amendment and then raise the debt ceiling? We've talked a lot about this. but There's a very good reason why he can't invoke the 14th Amendment. It would be unconstitutional for the president to uh, violate uh, the provisions on debt and spending. I mean, who will buy the bond that the government issues under the circumstance of invoking the 14th Amendment, when it's it's very clear to many of us and most constitutional scholars that that wouldn't be constitutional. Remember, the 14th Amendment was one of the Reconstruction Amendments. Mm-hmm. And um, think about it. The radical Republicans, as they were called, who were the radical abolitionists, mm-hmm. you know, that, I guess by being radical on that was a good thing. <laughs> I, I sure think so. Uh, but the radical ap- Republicans who controlled Congress, they were at war with Andrew Johnson, Yes. Who was president and who was a a many in many respects a a Confederate sympathizer. He was mm-hmm. a Democrat from Tennessee. He was a border state, but the notion that they would have created the Fourteenth Amendment, which says that all debts must be honored, etc., under provisions of law, the notion that they would have created the Fourteenth Amendment to give Andrew Johnson unfettered ability to issue debt without the approval of Congress is just simply ludicrous. Right. I can tell you how you don't need to be an originalist, a, a follower or a devotee of Justice Scalia, to come to that conclusion. So it would be a a very big mistake for the president to do this. And ask, think about it. He would be issuing the the saying that I can waive the debt ceiling in order to facilitate spending, not just paying debt. If it was just paying debt in in April, the the government received six hundred and fifty billion dollars of tax revenue. It's a re- typical uh, April fifteenth kind of uh, uh, month that they would get. They had thirty. They had about sixty billion dollars of debt to pay. So. Someone will say, well, you had $600 billion of revenue 
Why couldn't you pay the $60 billion? Some say you should prioritize pay because you had the revenue to do it. In March, the government received, say, $350 billion in revenue, and it still had about $60 billion of debt to pay. So the notion that the 14th Amendment which was crafted by the radical Republicans after the, after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, and they meant to make sure that you couldn't, the, if Southern politicians took control in Washington, that they couldn't forgive Confederate debt. That's why they did this. But the notion that the president can come in and, and just wave a, 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 uh, by the stroke of a pen the forgiveness uh, of the, or the removal of the debt limit to authorize more spending. Remember, spending is under control of the Congress. And right. so it would be fundamentally anti-democratic, uh, small d, if the president were to do this because it would usurp the constitutional role of Congress. It would, to my mind, be clearly unconstitutional. It wouldn't survive. And you talk about creating uncertainty as to the issuance of debt. Uh, if the president does this, it would, it would certainly create legal and constitutional uncertainty. I think it would set a dangerous precedent, too, right, in who in the future is elected and what they could do in turning toward author authoritarian kind of rule. Right. It would be... I think even the conversation right now is, uh, I think even the discussion would cause ripple, rippling effects in yeah. the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the letters. Brian says, I have a distant relative who's collecting public assistance. She is able-bodied, 30 plus years old with no children at home. She is unwilling to work even with family continually shaming her. I see no issue with a work requirement to force the issue in this case. I do believe, however, with this issue is a red herring trying to attract support for the Republican agenda, which likely includes far more devastating and hurtful cuts. The devil is in the details and the potential impacts on the poor aren't really being talked about. That from Brian. We also go to uh, Betsy. I heard John Faso claim that people are just not working when jobs are available, so work requirements will make them take these jobs and not need SNAP. I have news for you. I was working and on SNAP. I doubt Mr. Faso would know a SNAP recipient from anyone else. I think he has a stereotype about who we are. Then, well, I think she may have a stereotype about me, but that's <laughs> leave that that's aside. A very good point. Uh, we go to Maureen, your panelist who is concerned about employers who can fill positions is forgetting that we are barring immigrants from entering the country. These are the folks who do the jobs that are going without employees. Unless we address this issue, employers will continue to be shorthanded. Then Dave checks in and so said, no less a constitutional scholar than Lawrence Tribe has already said that the 14th Amendment is indeed constitutional. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll continue. We have many more letters. We have many more topics. And uh, we have lots of really brilliant thoughts in the heads of our panelists. They will dispense those at <laughs> will right after this. With the headline debt ceiling negotiations back on, we have been discussing the issue this morning. And that has gotten us a lot of letters. And I'd like to get through as many of those as possible to the top of the hour break with anyone on the panel. Um, please uh, invited to jump in if you have anything that you would like to add or comment on regarding the letter. Leonard says, why do you think those jobs are empty? Because they don't pay well enough to justify the level of work, pay the people what they're worth, rather than treating them as nothing more than a number on a ledger, says Leonard. Jeffrey, my foggy crystal ball cleared momentarily and indicated that powers that be will announce, quote, a lot of historic progress has been made, announce an extension bill and state that a compromise bill is taking shape. Ultimately, the far right and far left members will howl when the compromise bill hits the floor to be voted on and life goes on. Cynicism, I wow. believe. Yes. <laughs> Howell. Um, John, <laughs> John Faso. Uh, th this is from John about John. 
All right. Uh, it's, it's a dear John. Did you just send it? Yes. It's, it's a dear John. It's a John to John. John Fesso knows his descriptions of the House bill was wildly incomplete. He knows that the only way Kevin McCarthy got 217 votes, including George Santos, was by telling moderate members, don't worry about what's in the bill. These draconian cuts are never going to happen. I wish four or five New York Republican moderates would act the way the MAGAs act and refuse to vote on any bill that doesn't include rolling back the Trump taxes for the rich. However, I won't hold my breath that Molinaro, Waller, and others do the right thing. The tax bill actually has a lot of provisions that expire in 2025, and that's when these issues are going to be uh, renewed in terms of the discussion. Yep. Let's go to Peter. <laughs> Tell that guy that the spending has already been approved by Congress. It's the cap that's holding it up. <laughs> One of the two of you. Tell that guy. Yeah, that guy. All right. No, that guy. Um, all right. We go to uh, consider them told. <laughs> Jerry says if employers up their pay, they will find workers. It is called the market. Then we go to Nancy. Our current debt has already been approved by the Congress. The Congress is now refusing to pay that debt. That is where the president has the right to invoke the Constitution to force the Congress to pay the debt. It really is not rocket science. No, the, the Constitution actually is, is not rocket science. It's lit, written there in black and white, and uh, it it would be very, very constitutionally suspect if the president were to take this step. Um, he's he's done some things before uh, that uh, have been constitutionally suspect, like the student loan uh, plan, which I believe the Supreme Court will uh, make uh, work of uh, very shortly. But uh, uh, the mor eviction moratorium was another where the president said that uh, he basically and his advisors advised him that this was likely unconstitutional to extend that, but he went ahead and did it anyway, saying, well, maybe I'll get another month or two out of it before the court struck it down. So, I mean, I think that that one of the concerns I have about our whole system, and this was back in the in the Trump presidency, I was very much against the way he used the tariff power uh, in a way, for instance, against our Canadian neighbors uh, to the north on, on a national security basis, which was ludicrous because the Canadians pose no military threat to the United States. Indeed, they're our closest allies. So the, the, the tendency of the executive, whether they're Democrat or Republican, to uh, assert authority that they is not given them in the Constitution, if, whether it's in trade or whether it's in, say, the Biden student loan uh, proposal, um, is very dangerous to our democratic system. And uh, you know, it you know, people will say, "Well, Congress isn't working; they're not getting the job done." Well, that still isn't an excuse to violate the Constitution. We, I would point back in the in the late part of the 19th century, the last 25 years. Congress, the control of Congress shifted about four or five times based upon the free coinage of silver issue. Mm -hmm. And of course, that issue went away and no one remembers it now. But that's where people can assert their uh, democratic right to uh, send representatives to Washington to do, to do what they want uh, or to not do what they, they don't want. So that's where we should be focused on, on trying to make sure that Congress does its job, but also make sure the president doesn't overstep. Because otherwise, what separates us from those totalitarian systems mm -hmm. where they just run roughshod over the courts and over the people's elected representatives? Mm -hmm. I, I think what we've seen in the last, I would say, 10 years has been um, you know, le legislative encroachment on the executive authority. We've seen the executive also um, overstep executive authority. And I think in both instances, we have um, people that want to get caught trying, right? Mm -hmm. we, we see yeah. these very favorable political issues, whether it's the moratorium on housing or student loans. And I, I think they even take that step knowing that, that they're going, as you said, buying three months, buying four months. Uh, but they want to be caught trying. Mm -hmm. 
Back to the mailbag, we go to Will, who says, okay, John, so we should not raise taxes on the extremely well-off, but instead torment the lowest income people in our society? The debt ceiling should not be held hostage by, quote-unquote, terrorists, because they want a win, nor to make the president look bad. Only Republicans do this. You should be ashamed of your allegiance to that political party. Yeah, John. What'd you do? What'd you do, man? Someone got up on the wrong side of the bed today. <laughs> you know, it's it's it's. Um, I I think that this is a very serious issue, though the the issue of the debt ceiling, uh, and it and it is as David said, um, it it does send a bad message as to the ability of the United States to solve problems. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you could look at it as well. The people around the world see. We have these messy, divisive fights, and we kind of hash it out, and ultimately we come, as Winston Churchill once said, Americans always, you know, uh, uh, you know, consider all the alternatives uh, until they finally come to the right one. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the the fact is, is that you know we're we're showing our system to be one where there's disagreement. It can be aired. It's not suppressed. And um, that's a that's a good thing, but I hope I hope compromise wins out on this thing, and I believe it will. James says there are work requirements if you collect general public assistance and SNAP benefits. There are exceptions for raising children, the handicap, and the elderly. I am on SNAP, and they do ask about where you work, how often, and how much you make. I currently work at Walmart and don't make enough to get by because my job doesn't pay enough for me to live in my current area without these benefits. There is a minimum number of hours of mandatory work to qualify to continue to receive these benefits. Walmart needs to raise wages or I need SNAP to survive here. That from James. We then go to John. Both sides uh, do it full stop. Does that mean both sides do it in equal measure, equal intensity and equal extremity? If no, then both sides do not do it. Shouty caps. Every time that dubious phrase is uttered, it should be challenged immediately. Shouty caps. Accountability might be on the life on life support, but the concept is not dead. That from John. Then we go to this letter on the 14th Amendment from David. Thank you, Mr. Fasto, for your explanation of the 14th Amendment. Given the language of that amendment, as written, can we guarantee that no configuration of the Supreme Court could interpret it otherwise? I think so. In fact, uh, what was heartening about the U.S. Supreme Court in recent weeks is the number of, the number of nine to zero decisions that they, <laughs> that they issued. So, again, that didn't get a lot of coverage in the media. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear that, that if the president were to act uh, contrary, say he had the power to, to issue uh, more debt and, and fund more appropriations uh, without the author authority of Congress, I think it would be struck down. Frank writes, David's point about lack of compromise is understood. However, can Mr. Faso explain why the debt limit was raised automatically without problem during the Trump presidency? It wasn't, actually. And, and when it was done in 2019, uh, the president, uh, in fact, Senator McConnell pointed this out the other day, uh, you know, the president didn't want to have to negotiate with Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. but he did because he had to. Mm -hmm. And what did Speaker Pelosi want? She wanted about three to four hundred billion dollars of additional discretionary spending. And she got it as a as a condition for raising the debt ceiling. Tim writes, putting people to work as a requirement to receiving Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is one thing, and another would be to stand up a national child care plan uh, to stand up a national child care plan to help support those who want to enter the employed ranks. Then we go to Dave, who says, no less a constitutional scholar. I read that one. I apologize for the repeat. Let's be clear. Permitting reform, says David, by the Republicans is targeting fossil fuels. So to pay already incurred bills, we need to exacerbate an, an existential threat. How is this a good compromise for our children? Writes David. Then Matt says... 
There is no compromise. David says there is no compromise in politics where the debt ceiling is concerned, as if the Dems just need to cooperate with the hostage takers. But this whole situation wouldn't be a situation if the Republican followed normal debt ceiling protocol and compromised by separating the two issues of debt ceiling increase versus future spending policy. Compromise is not the Dems just allowing the Republicans to take what they want by force. I think we've seen both parties take advantage of this specific issue to leverage to get what they've wanted. Uh, and this has been done historically. So, you know, you can't now, when the Republicans have control of the House, um, you know, take aim at them and, and, and the issues that they support, like like energy, like clean energy, not clean energy, but fossil fuel uh, legislation. Kevin says, where is the agency or clearinghouse to connect the unemployed seeking assistance with the jobs? <laughs> then Andrew says, what's the point of work requirements if unemployment is down around 3%? Who's left to work? Immigrants. Sounds more like a lack of immigration problem to me. Then we go three quick letters, and then we'll go to news. Irene says, I'm listening closely to what Mr. Faso is saying about SNAP. I don't really understand his explanation as to why able-bodied people under 60 aren't required to look for work. His explanation is missing nuance, meaning the details that are important when making statements like that. I can't believe him. His talking points are typical of Republicans that don't really understand why people stay on public assistance. Then we go to Jen. Listening to the discussion of getting people back to work with John Faso, there is a strong discrimination against single people with no kids that needs to be discussed. I'm single. I have to pay 100% of my mortgage myself. I pay more in taxes than a married couple. I pay more in taxes than people with kids. Utilities, food, and gas are not last because only one person is using them. Having kids doesn't make you a hero in an overpopulated world. Having kids should never be a discrimination point when people who are single bear the costs of schools and education with using those systems. My daily costs far exceed my friends with children. I don't disagree with his view, but his qualifiers aren't right by any means. We'll take a break there and we'll move on. We welcome um, we welcome your letters, panel at wamc.org, panel at wamc.org. We'll be back with much more content right after Ray Graff and News. Good morning. Welcome back to the roundtable and to our panel discussion for this Monday morning. It is the 22nd of May, eight minutes past 10 o'clock. John Faso, Jennifer Burns, and David Soares with us on this broadcast. We welcome you, panel at wamc.org, panel at wamc.org. Let us move on to uh, other, tap uh, other topics. I think we're all debt ceilinged out for today. <laughs> But don't worry, it'll be, we'll talk about it more, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Let's go to the G7. President Biden announcing more aid for Ukraine as the group of seven powers meet in Japan. The uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine received vows of resolute support and promises of further weapon weapon shipment, even as Russian forces claim to have received, uh, received the war-torn city of Bakhmut. The uh, president, uh, President Biden, and other leaders of the world's industrial democracies rallied around Ukraine on Sunday with vows of support and promises of further weapons. Mr. Biden and his counterparts figuratively and in some cases literally wrapped their arms around the president of Ukraine, who made an audacious journey halfway around the world from his ravaged homeland to Hiroshima, Japan, to solicit aid for the first time in person from the Group of Seven at their annual summit. Together with the entire G7, we have Ukraine's back, and I promise we're not going anywhere, Mr. Biden told Mr. Zelensky while announcing another $375 million in artillery, ammunition, and other arms for Ukraine. At a later news conference, Mr. Biden voiced defiance of President Vladimir Putin of Russia. I once more shared and assured President Zelensky together with all G7 members and our allies and partners around the world that we will not waver. Putin will not break our resolve as he thought he could. David? Well, 
I think we need to continue to send that message and send it as loudly and as as globally as we can. And I cannot think of a greater stage um, than for for our president to have sent that message. Um, you know, we're getting the the almost daily reports of what's happening right now in this conflict. Um, and I do understand that in terms of, you know, President Putin, what he wants is to prolong um, this war. And the more that he can prolong it, uh, the better it is for him. And I think his gamble and his hope is that he will exhaust uh, the American and global resolve uh, towards helping um you know, our, our, our Ukrainian friends. And um, I, I just think that that was a very important message to have sent uh, to, to President Zelensky. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, right now we have to continue to support his efforts and support the, the defense of uh, Ukraine. And we need to provide um, him with as many uh, tools as he can in order to effectively defend uh, his borders. Jennifer? Um. <laughs> I guess what I'm struggling with here is how sometimes we fail to see that the G7 and the United States in particular is really controlling so much of the direction of this war. Um, right. It's fine steps to not really, um, in, you know, excite Putin in a way where he does something that everybody claims will be catastrophic. But at the same time, our, I, mean, I know we can't just deliver all kinds of things immediately, but our staggered approach has an economic kind of coercion feel to it to me. Um, and I think part of what's going on is the United States' real focus on China and how China is going to move. Um, so I, I think it's important that we're supporting Ukraine, but I don't think we're paying enough attention to how we're um, kind of going back and forth and really negotiating in a way that's kind of extending the suffering in Ukraine. John. Well, I'm glad that the president uh, said that he would um, uh, have Ukrainian pilots uh, be trained in the F-16. Um, candidly, I wish that was something that he did many, many months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I also hope that uh, the long-awaited Abrams tanks are, are delivered quicker than uh, had previously been considered. And the other issue that we have, and this is why it's important that we maintain, because of China, because mm -hmm. of these challenges with Iran and Russia, yeah. it's we have to maintain uh, our defense forces in a way that, that makes our deterrence credible. The, the best way we deter armed conflict with China or uh, and the United States is to maintain a very strong, credible defense capability. And uh, that burden is not going to be borne by any other nation than the United States. The Europeans finally, uh, the Germans recently, are stepping up. Uh, they've been very laggard, even despite some of their um, announcements last year. And uh, I think you're seeing with with Finland and Sweden, hopefully the Swedes get into NATO uh, with the uh, Turkish objections going away. But uh, when you see the Finns and the Swedes joining NATO, you know that finally the Europeans have awakened to the threat that Putin mm -hmm. uh, that he is. And uh, the energy extortion that he's attempted over Western Europe is something that uh, is is should be a wake up call for Americans in terms of how we uh, address our energy policies. But I, I'm, I'm pleased that the president continues to enunciate uh, strong support for Ukraine. Uh, it has to go beyond the rhetoric. And I think we're we're showing that we're we're prepared to continue to f help them in this fight. I, I happen to believe that the staggered approach has been very appropriate. And I know that there have been critics that have wanted, um, you know, basically to give um, the Ukrainians everything all at once instead of what they're doing mm -hmm. now. But I think that I think that America, and especially with NATO, has had to play this, this very cautious, uh, they've had to manage the escalation of this war. And, and the, the, the escalation on a variety of different fronts, not wanting Ukraine to launch, you know, missiles 
you know, into the capital of of um, of of Russia, not wanting them to be, um, you know, provocative to the extent, and I say that in air quotes, to the extent that you're defending yourself from from that kind of uh, aggression. But I think that America has been, and, and our European and NATO partners have been very good at managing um, this battle and this effort, and have had to take these kind of steps in order to make sure that we don't have uh, escalation. But one of the risks that we have was... Um in our own defense infrastructure, uh, the ability to produce the artillery sh- munitions, the ability to produce the HIMARS, artiller- long-range artillery uh, systems, um, we have a limited capacity. And, and the one thing that this Ukrainian war um, of aggression by Russia uh, has awakened in, in Americans, I think, and certainly in among members of Congress on both sides, is the fact that we just can't put our foot on the accelerator and deliver Everything. the kind of weaponry that we need because we don't have the capacity to build it. And that's really that's really concerning, especially when you consider the multifaceted threats that, that we are facing around the world right now, especially China, Iran, uh, Russia. It's truly... Um, a dangerous situation that we're in. Well, and last night I was watching um, 60 Minutes, and the first segment was on the investigation that was led by the DOJ on the increase that the government was being charged for producing these military weapons, right? So that there was a consolidation of many companies in America down to about five or six. And then they raised the costs on missiles and all of these other things. So the U.S. was spending billions of dollars more on the same items. So they kind of price gouged the government, the military on this. Um, And now you look at how we're dealing with our debt spending, we're looking at our budgeting, we're looking at our military expenditures. And some of those things are coming down to how do we get in check these companies that are you know, charging us a lot of money to have this kind of equipment that then we would like to use or send to the Ukraine. So it, it, overall, it's increasing our military spending on both ends. And this is a this is a longstanding problem. I, uh, Harry Truman made his reputation in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Senate before he was nominated for vice president in 1944. Harry Truman made his reputation by exposing uh, profiteering mm-hmm. uh, by uh, companies taking advantage, and this you can go back to the Revolutionary War and find instances mm-hmm. of this. So yes, we absolutely have to be vigilant uh, purchasers of mm-hmm. this kind of equipment. We also have to recognize that the inflation factor that is that has occurred in the last year and a half in of general prices in our yeah. economy is affecting this sector as well. So whether it's acquisition of raw materials um, it is, or the component parts, and making sure we're not uh, importing those mm-hmm. from unfriendly enemies. countries right. Yeah. Right. as well, it, it, it is going to be, it continues to be a real issue. There's so many things that I think has exposed our economy. I think, uh, you know, these supply chains have exposed the limitations within our own economy. And, and if that can trigger a bipartisan, you know, discussions about, uh, you know, repatriation or expanding our manufacturing base, there's just so many areas within our own country that is in desperate need of, um, of, of that kind of economic impact. You're right. When you look at what it what happened in the G seven, so where do we where do you think we go from here in the next time you know meaningful talks take place and and where all of these sides get together and discuss what what the plan is? You know, one the one thing that I'm very very curious about is uh, Finland and their contributions. Um, you know, to to this thing so often said. Yeah, you know, I, don't think that <laughs> I mean, we we have. I mean, that's a that is a nation that has uh, one of the premier military, um, you know, uh, forces in in the world, and their technology, the amount of weapons that they have stockpiled. I mean, they have been preparing for um, their defense of of uh, against you know an aggressive Russia. Right. For the better part of of the last you know mm-hmm. six seven decades, and so it'll be interesting to see whether or not their contributions 
um, will lessen, you know, some of the contributions that we unfortunately have have uh, been taking on all by ourselves. All right, let's move on to other topics, and we welcome you, panel at wamc.org, panel at wamc.org. So uh, let us talk about Uvalde. It is uh, Wednesday. We'll mark the one-year anniversary of the shooting at U- Uvalde in Texas, and uh, some officials and residents are in conflict with victim supporters over information as well as legislation as this one year um, one year anniversary approaches this week. A year ago, a gunman marched into Uvalde's Robb Elementary School, shut himself in a classroom, and massacred 19 fourth graders and two teachers, while hundreds of police officers stood outside. Those connected to the victims and their advocates have spent the past year battling for information and battling for legislation. Some of their neighbors, however, want the noise to stop. Even in an era of frequent mass shootings, the Robb Elementary attack shocked the world. Law enforcement waited to intervene for more than an hour, even as children within the classroom called 911, begging for help when a Border Patrol tactical team finally entered and took down the killer. They saw he had written LOL on a whiteboard with the victim's blood. Now, with the one-year mark approaching, the South Texas town of 15,400 is divided over how to move forward. Many families of those killed and their advocates continue to be vocal in their efforts to get information, while officials say that information, um, that investigation of the incident has to take priority over releasing information. Advocacy for new gun legislation has also led to conflict. This from the Wall Street Journal. John? Well, it's hard to say any more than what you just said. I mean, this was just a horrific tragedy. And what music to I a think, talk show host's ears. It, uh, <laughs> Well, you, you've been actually you've you've actually been uh, rather uh, reticent today. I think you, not your normal perky, uh, innovative self in terms of. Uh, he hasn't taken any bullets for you. He, ha- he hasn't. He hasn't. But uh, perky and innovative. I'll work right. on that. Yeah. It it it's what what I find truly mystifying in this was that one hour delay of those law enforcement to go in, and I still have not heard a. A good explanation. I don't think there is one, frankly, uh, of what happened, how that command structure broke down, and um, what they've done to make sure that 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 doesn't occur again. There have been other the shooting in Nashville that happened a number of months ago. Uh, those law enforcement officers intervened right away, and they prevented what would have been a greater tragedy. So, um, but I, I still think that. Uh, Officials down there need need to be more forthcoming with this information as to what actually was going on there with law enforcement. The the tone was set by that chief as well as the support that that chief received from um, the, the local political body in Uvalde. So but think of you, how you long have it took a, to get rid of that chief. It, it, co- correct, because there was I think there was a lot of information that was withheld early on. Right. There was a lot of uh, misrepresentation of facts that took place early on. And he seemed that chief seemed to be enjoying the protection and cover. If you recall, that chief was about to become part of that body. Um, And so I think that you have uh, in, in the infancy stages of this tragedy, you had distrust and that distrust has just continued to to um, to grow as time has gone on. And here we are one year one year later, it's it's hard for me to imagine that um, whether it's federal, the federal body, the state agencies within that jurisdiction haven't been able to um, to come up with a, a lot of information that they can share. I certainly understand um, them not having you know everything complete. Uh, I think what took place there was was. W- was incredible, and I don't think that you can go back and and recreate right. um, a, a lot of those um, uh, you know those is, those issues without having time. Um, but I do think that there's enough that's taken place within one calendar year that they can, in fact, share some information 
with with the public. Um, but I think that what we're seeing right now in Uvalde, uh, in terms of the tensions that 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 are there, are, are they've they've always been there. It's just grown. Jennifer, um, you know what makes I mean this stinks like a cover up. It is very clear, and we saw this from the beginning, right? That the the law enforcement and and the strategy that they had in Uvalde was chaotic. I mean, it wasn't. It doesn't appear in everything that I've read and watched that they actually had a plan to try to address this kind of issue if it happened. And we saw that with who couldn't figure out whom was in charge of taking the direction to actually lock down the school after the shooter was in it, right? Everybody thought it was somebody else who was in charge to take order from. And so, yes, I think investigations take a long time, but I think part of the issue here may also be that people are trying to cover up a little bit of what they didn't do correctly and also to clean this up so it doesn't look like the chaos within the system itself that was definitely present when the shooting started. It's impossible for me to believe that this department did not have a SWAT trained team. You have departments all over the country that train for very specific issues, this being one of them. Um, Prior to Uvalde, there were plenty of examples out there in the world of mass shooters in different scenarios in in public spaces. Um, And every police department trains um, in taking down um, an, an active shooter. And if the department isn't large enough for them to, to, to have a SWAT team on their own, they're usually part of a task force that, that takes surrounding departments that create that team. Um, what, I think is, what, what I think happened here is a combination of incompetence and cowardice. Yeah, and what is on paper sounds good and looks good. But in reality, if it works, is a whole different story, right? And I think that's some of what we're seeing in Uvalde, is that there might have been pieces on paper all over that had different departments and SWATs and tasks and all of these things. But the reality of who gets there, when, who's in charge, right? The, some of the positions, the leaders were changing, um, right? Because they were um, there was an election or something, right? So some people had um, were, were leaving office. Other people are coming in at different places, yeah. too, which complicates it, right? Are they still working on something? The chief, or already the chief was out? still there. The chief was still there, and this has been the chief that would have overseen um, a SWAT team. They, he would have had uh, decisions as to who participates mm-hmm. in a SWAT team. There, there's no executive in law enforcement that, um, that, that, has, that doesn't engage in collaboration with neighboring departments that are not uh, part of um, agencies or, or not part of um, uh, task forces that are taking on, you know, um, uh, threats, uh, threats that not only impact their community, but neighboring communities as well. It, it's it's hard. I mean, we've we've heard uh, we've seen the video video of, of what was going on. Um, we've heard the shots be fired. We've heard. um I mean, just the time frame is so troubling of how long it took, and 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 I I don't why parents can't get even some answers seems to be to be just in, in, insane. Yeah. Uh, um, because I understand all the the legal ramifications mm-hmm. of that, but by the same token, um. They're, they're killed. Their children were killed. It's even worse when you consider um, when you consider uh, we have our neighbors here in, in the capital district. We so have America, our, uh, our our FBI. We have federal agencies. We have state agencies. We have local agencies, and there's a great collaborative spirit. So even even if we had to trace every single bullet and and how that bullet traveled, there's enough agencies that have the technology, the expertise that that also could be involved in in finding and delivering these answers. And the idea that we're here one year out and we still have nothing is just so troubling. And as you say, mm-hmm. it, eeks, it, it reeks of cover-up. Uh, yes. And um, I note when the uh, Pulitzer Prize were announced that uh, Shimon Prokopez from CNN uh, was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and I think um, looking at some of the uh, at some of the reporting that he has done on this issue is is uh, rather enlightening. And I know he just had a, an anniversary special. There's there's 
some really good questions that are asked within the context of that. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll continue. We welcome you. Panel at WAMC.org. Panel at WAMC.org. We will continue right after this short break in BBC News. As the words were cascading from my lips, I knew I was not saying the right thing. So I, I was talking about Shimon Prokopez, and I, and I said Pulitzer Prize. It, it's the two other P awards, the Polk Award and the Peabody Award. Mm. So my apologies. I, I knew as I was saying mm-hmm. it, I was making a mistake. Uh, so uh, the Polk and the, uh, and the Peabody just for the sake of correcting myself. All right, let's go on and make uh, find out what else is making news. And we welcome you, panel at WAMC.org, panel at WAMC.org. And we would, uh, as always, love to hear from you. Let's go to the um, Tim Scott campaign. Um, what Tim Scott's 2024 campaign could mean for black Republicans. This from the New York Times. Um, Senator Tim Scott, a Republican of South Carolina, addressed the Charleston County Republican Committee at a dinner in February, offering a stirring message of unity and American redemption that has become the center of his stump speech. The next day, he called the chairman of the county party to ask for support. Mr. Scott told the chairman that he was considering a presidential run. The chairman, who had planned to endorse former President Donald Trump, told the senator he would switch allegiances and back him instead. The exchange was in some ways traditional party politicking as Mr. Scott works to build support in his home county and in his home state. But it also underscored a subtle change shaping GOP politics. Both men are black Republicans. I'm pretty locked in helping Senator Scott in every way that I possibly can, said the former county party leader, Maurice Washington, who stepped down from his role as chairman in April. It was Mr. Washington, Charleston County's first black Republican chairman and longtime ally ally of Mr. Scott's, who first encouraged him to run for a county council seat nearly 30 years ago. Mr. Scott, who plans to formally announce his presidential campaign today, will become one of a handful of black conservatives to run for president in recent years, uh, adding to the list of Herman Cain and Ben Carson. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, David, go first, please. Herman Cain. Oh, well, this is going to be a very interesting um, uh, campaign. I, personally, <clears throat> I really, really, really like... Um, Mr. Scott's story, um, you know, the uh, son of uh, of uh, uh, descendants of uh, slaves, and a person who um, credits his his family, um, the the culture in which he was raised, with his success. He's very quick to always remind people of his background. Um, he's got a very wonderful story about uh, being an, an, an African American in the Carolinas, growing up uh, in that culture. Um, I think that he's going to be one of those candidates that people uh, tend to underestimate. But I think with like Barack Obama's campaign, when he first made those announce, when he first made his announcement, I think uh, people underestimated him. This is a campaign that. Uh, can be that that um, he can be that candidate that I think runs a, a civil um, and raises important issues as opposed to slinging mud, which I think a lot of the other candidates are going to be engaged in. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, but uh, I think uh, he will add a sober voice to to the uh, primary for the Republican nomination. Jennifer. Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> I um, am complimenting you on that because <laughs> I... I'm not suggesting to you that I agree with his policies, <clears throat> but certainly I yes, think... Yes, his story is nice, but I also find it a little bit um, denialism. 
of the racism that does take place across America, especially saying it in a day and age when we're watching increased violence happen to black men, particularly in America, of different classes, largely across the country. And he sort of acts like that's not really happening, like you're, you know, you're li- don't believe your lying eyes. And then he will sometimes use that race as a dog whistle to say, well, I've experienced a few encounters of racism. And so see, everything can just be, you know, it's individualistic, let it go away. And I find that quite hypocritical on his part. And I find it a little bit uh, power hungry. And I, I think he, while having a nice story and having what appears to be good values, also cannot get enough likes as the young people say, um, from his colleagues either. Um, The one major initiative that I was hoping that he would be able to work with uh, Democrats on was police reform. And that did not happen. And nobody said it was to blame him or to blame Hakeem Jeffries or others. But the fact that he has largely, in all of my research, walked away from the issue is a problem. And I think Democrats should really bring that up in addition to his clarifying abortion in the future. John. Well, Senator Scott is um, highly regarded within the Republican Party. He's uh, got good friends on both sides of the aisle in in D.C. He works well with colleagues. Um, He's well-liked. And he's starting in Iowa with $8 million worth of advertising. Mm -hmm. He comes into the campaign with uh, a $22 million war chest, which he's built up. Uh, there, there'll be an outside uh, super PAC uh, supporting his candidacy as well. I like he's got an optimistic message, a vision for the country. And I think that uh, uh, as a black Republican, he uh, is going to attract new voters. And the question is, um, uh, you know, there'll be other candidates that come forth uh, this week. Ron DeSantis is going to announce this week. I'm told that Chris Christie is announcing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the governor of North Dakota, Governor Borgum, is is going to announce. Um, so th- the field is growing. Uh, some are concerned that uh, that will put the GOP back in the same position that it was in 16 uh, with a multiple candidate field. And Donald Trump was able to, you know, get 30 percent. Very uh, large consistently. stage. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, How do you feel about that? <clears throat> well, I, th- I think that... Uh, it's good that we have multiple candidates. I, I'm hopeful that uh, if a candidate doesn't receive appreciable support by a certain period of time in the race, that they'll see the writing on the wall and, and, and drop, uh, drop out. Uh, but because uh, I don't think it would be uh, the best solution uh, for the country, most importantly, and the Republican Party if Donald Trump is the nominee in Is that polling or votes when you say support? Um, well— uh, could be like Kamala Harris, who withdrew from the campaign in 2020 before the first vote was cast. Well, that's what I'm asking. So yeah. it, it's going to be both. It's going to be money raised. It's going to be polling. It's going to be having a message that resonates. I think the message needs to be one talking about the future, not arguing about the past necessarily. Not that you forget the past, but that you 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 be future oriented because that's what most voters want to mm-hmm. hear. And I candidly, I think that the the big issue on the presidential race is that 70 percent of Americans don't want Joe Biden to be running and 60 percent of Americans don't want Donald Trump to mm-hmm. be running. So you have a, a fairly strong majority of the population that does not want to see a Biden-Trump race in 24. And I, I hope that uh, the political process brings us to that point mm-hmm. where we have alternatives. John, but, do you think the National Party can get the candidates to agree to that metric, would, no. as you say? No, I, think I don't think... the think... last time it was, I think it was the amount of money raised, it was the polling, right, that... Uh... Gotcha on the stage. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I think I think the reality is is that if, if a candidate is not getting the kind of support they need, financial and political, uh, they have no they have no room. They have no place to go other than get out of the race. Well, so, But it's early now. It's still, it's only May. 
uh, of the, the year before the election. So I do think that there's time for these candidates. Governor Sununu of New Hampshire may be getting in as well. Right. So there's time for them to go out there and show their stuff. Uh, and that's what this summer is is intended to do. And, and we'll see where it, where it takes us. But um, I'm encouraged by Tim Scott uh, getting in. It's kind of presents an interesting dynamic in with Nikki Haley, mm-hmm. who appointed him to mm-hmm. the Senate uh, in South Carolina. They kind of have the same, much of the same political base within South Carolina. But this is going to be, it's a beauty contest to go out there and show the folks in Iowa and other states across the country uh, what their stuff is and, and where they're coming from and how they, they differ from uh, 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 the past uh, nominee of the Republican Party. And that's really what... Uh, uh, what I think is going to it's going to come down to. I you know I keep wondering, is the Republican Party ready though nationwide? Are they ready to elect the second black president of the United States well, the and same, have it be Tim Scott? Is the wider Republican Party same ready question, for that? Same question was asked about Barack Obama in two thousand seven. You know, the, the, is the country ready? And you know what? Refreshingly. This country uh, elected the first African-American president. Not that I agreed with 90 percent of what his positions were, but I thought that was a hopeful sign about— So there was 10 percent that you agreed with? (laughs) (laughs) I think there there were. We didn't do a scientific survey on that, Uh, but um, I think that was a hopeful sign. And, you know, people that lament the state of racial relations in the country, I I think this is a remarkably different country than the one— that I was growing up in in the 60s. I was born in the 50s, I hate to say. But um, it's a remarkably different country in terms of our acceptance of, of different people, different groups, et cetera. And the, the, the one metric that I really look at is what's the percentage of interracial marriages in our country today? It's, it's about 20 percent when, you know, 30, 40 years ago it was under 5 percent. And I think that's a sign of greater racial tolerance and acceptance in our country that is broader than a lot of the stuff that, um, you know, might be out there in in some of the more incendiary folks in the media. Well, that makes me wonder, you know, um, and and I agree with you 100 percent on that. Um, It brings in to account the youth vote. Right. Especially if we're talking about abortion. The youth vote will be really front and center in how they're viewing black, white or, you know, everyone in America when it comes to the youth. Tim Scott's campaign, if he were to be nominated. Um, But then also it draws into the conversation because of the interracial marriage bit, Clarence Thomas. And if people are looking beyond just who's elected president, but to how this is going to relate to the Supreme Court and others. And Clarence Thomas being that really one of probably the most I would say, powerful black Republican in the country, right? It, it, it makes you wonder if some people will say mm, that might be too much to elect Tim Scott as president with Clarence Thomas in the Supreme Court. No, I don't think so. I, I, Jennifer, I've already I, had some people talk about I, it to me. I, 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 I don't. <laughs> They're I thinking don't, about I it. I think those. I, I, I just don't. I don't see the the relationship on the, on the, that score. But you know, Tim Scott. Uh, or Nikki Haley. One of the important things about being out there and running mm-hmm. is that. Typically, people that run for president who don't make it might wind up being nominated for vice president. That's true. And Tim Scott would be a very appealing candidate, I think, for either position. Um, and, you know, he's he's got a story to tell, and, and he delivers it in an affirmative way, uh, an optimistic way. And I think, you know, that— as a as someone who uh, really admired the way in which Ronald Reagan presented himself to the country— um, he always spoke optimistically about the shining city on the hill and about a better America. And that's really what I think successful candidates uh, uh, do uh, most frequently. And, and I think that what I'm waiting to see is whether or not the, 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 the Donald Trump venom has been cleared from the, the, the body politic of the Republican Party. Um, because it's, that's a very contrasting, very contrasting candidates there. Donald Trump wing of the party, and as well as the and the moderate wing of the party, has has that venom been flushed from the Republican body? That's what a campaign is for, yeah. mm-hmm. and we we will find out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let it be known that a campaign is for flushing. 
<laughs> We've been howling. It would be interesting to see like a Nikki Haley, right, with Tim Scott or vice versa. Yes. Well, they're from that the same state. That would violate the Constitution. Uh, it would? Yes. Oh, I didn't know President that. and vice presidential nomination can't be can't from be the same, same state. state. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's good to know. Tricky. Somebody might move quickly. <laughs> well, in, in, We've seen in, it before. <laughs> in, in 2000, Dick Cheney was a resident of Texas, and he heroly scurried back to Wyoming right. in order to reestablish his residency <laughs> right. in Texas for that very reason. Hmm. All right. So you can see somebody relocate. Pay shot. attention, right? It might be a hint. So you can't you can't uh, infringe upon the the debt in the Fourteenth Amendment, and you can't have a VP and a presidential candidate from the same state. So that's I our constitution so lesson today. Takeaways show. today. Those are your. T-